name is uh, Ed Raral. I'm the Vice Dean of Research at the school. We are very honored to have with us today Tavi Rovas, if I pronounce it right. Tavi is the Vice President of the Estonian Parliament, and he was previously the Prime Minister of Estonia from 2014 to 2016. He is a tech-savvy enthusiast of innovative solutions and has a first-hand experience on how to govern a digital society as uh, Estonia has become one of the most wide countries in the world, a global leader in e-government, and has one of the highest number of startups per capita. So today, the Prime Minister will tell us Estonia's secrets. One of the cores of my talk will be telling how we have seen technology as the enabler of better democracy, better public services. So basically, it, I will link uh, the technological development to uh, what is taught and, and studied here in, in this uh, very respectable um, uh, school. Our dream is that um, all countries uh, will learn from each other's uh, best practices. Uh, we are here with a very uh, prominent business delegation to learn from what Singapore has been doing. I think that there is a lot uh, to learn, uh, not only for Estonia, but, but globally, it's, uh, especially when we talk about um, uh, economic development, when we talk about how to create a society that has uh, openness uh, for business and, and for investments. Uh, Singapore has often mentioned as a role model uh, for, um, for a global audience and, and Estonia has certainly been uh, following very closely what, what we can learn. And I, I hope that there is something to learn also uh, the other way around. And, and uh, e-government perhaps could be um, one of those things. Just to give you an idea uh, about Estonia. Estonia is situated uh, as the closest uh, EU country to Singapore there is. That's where it is. We have 45,000 uh, square kilometers, which is uh, a bit bigger than Denmark, a bit bigger than Switzerland, and a big, bit bigger than, um, than the Netherlands, for example, but we have only 1.3 million people living there. So when you come there, you, you have a chance to witness exceptionally beautiful nature. As you see uh, from almost three sides, uh, we are surrounded by water. One of the biggest uh, lakes in Europe uh, is at our east, it's called Lake Papus. And, and the, the north and, and west we have uh, uh, the Baltic Sea. Uh, and our neighbors are Finland, Russia, Latvia and, and Sweden. We have used Euro ever since 2011. I was today visiting uh, one of the two uh, very impressive uh, sovereign wealth funds that Singapore has. And uh, in a way, to a much smaller scale, Estonia has been doing a similar thing uh, to keep reserves instead of uh, borrowing too much. So we are the most fiscally prudent uh, country in the European Union. We are the only one actually in, a, in the European Union that has a, about the same amount of money in reserves as we have borrowed. So uh, it's not at the scale of Singapore by any means, but uh, most of the countries in Europe have a huge uh, sovereign uh, deficit. As I said, Singapore is a role model uh, to us because uh, there is a very good uh, way of comparing countries and this is something I believe not only students and teachers of um, uh, policy should do but this is something that politicians themselves should do and, and I have always been looking into what Estonia is good at and, and where we have room for improvement and, and in many cases when we see the top uh, there is Singapore in the absolute top so you know, this is not just soft understanding. It's, it's really empiric uh, following from uh, some of the uh, best uh, examples and of course I wouldn't be an Estonian politician if I wouldn't be a bit bragging about my country, telling you what are we good at. And one of those things is uh, tax competitiveness, which means that uh, our tax system is uh, very simple, very easy to use. And, and that, of course, is deliberately made this way or designed this way to attract foreign investments and, and uh, business activity. But very, very nice surprise is that World Economic Forum says that the most entrepreneurial country in the world is Estonia. So this is something we're very proud of, especially because we have several Estonian uh, companies uh, with us here from uh, very prominent and, and uh, well-established companies to startups that are stretching their wings uh, also in this, um, this area. And a couple of other things were, for example, the World Bank, a global ease of doing business. Uh, this is where Singapore, again, is, is global at the top. We are at the top of uh, European League and number 12 um, globally. I think every uh, rating like this which usually has around 10 to 20 uh, subcategories. This is actually one of the best to-do lists for any politician. It's making your job easy. You actually know 
what you have to do to uh, increase your country's rating in the ease of doing business. In Estonia, it is, for example, uh, how fast you will get the construction permit. If we can speed this thing up, we will immediately get a couple of uh, places uh, higher. So a wise politician does not need to invent the wheel. In many cases, uh, you can actually look at what others, uh, what, or what, what the, you, how you compare against others. Where we have in, uh, entered the, or invited the wheel is um, how we deal with um, uh, e-governance. This is Estonians uh, gathering in the Song Festival. This is uh, some crazy thing uh, Estonians have been doing for 150 years. All of those people have been experiencing the internet as a social right uh, for around two decades now. And the reason for that is that uh, Estonia, even though we are celebrating our 100th anniversary next year, we have continuously been independent uh, for 26 years. Uh, and uh, when we restarted the country from, you know, after Soviet occupation, after a uh, planned economy, which was um, completely unusable uh, in today's modern world, we were able to start it from this uh, tabula rasa from the pure sheet of paper, and, and we could build a, a, a government that was uh, digital from the beginning. Uh, we had no legacy systems from the 80s or 70s that we could actually use, so the only way doing that was building it from the skies. And that meant uh, in every part of society, public services, but also things like banks. Estonians don't know what the checkbook looks like because we have never used checkbook. Uh, even, even in the 90s, even in the 80s, we didn't have checkbooks. We went straight to internet banking already in the, in the, in the 90s. The second thing that uh, was introduced uh, very quickly to all Estonians is electronic identity. This is a bit like uh, SINPASS. This is a bit like uh, the Singapore government is planning to build on SINPASS. Uh, that was introduced uh, to everyone in Estonia in 2002. We didn't start, it's, it's fair to say that we didn't start using them instantly. It took us around three to four years to start using them. And, and the actual momentum came with um, a private public sector co cooperation, and uh, namely the banks. They told us that uh, if you want to transfer anything higher than um, 200 euros, which normally is the case, then you need to use the uh, digital ID which is safe. You have to forget about all the pin codes and calculators and, and all those, we had those code cards and everything. This is not safe uh, anymore, only use the um, uh, national ID. Be honest, I have to tell that uh, there has been a lot of work to ensure that people start trusting those solutions. Uh, it's not coming out of the blue. Many people uh, are afraid of um, whether this is uh, secure enough. Uh, many people are afraid of whether this is uh, private enough for you. So we have addressed those issues extremely thoroughly. You know, I don't want to worry you too much, but uh, I would argue, like at least, I will have at least 10 examples uh, why using uh, paper and, and conventional signature is not safe at all. For example, has any one of you seen Mr. Professor's uh, signature, on how it looks like? You have? All of you? You have? Good. Anyone else? Okay, so if you get a letter with his signature underneath, you just kind of assume that it was him, right? Not him, not him. So we kind of trust something to be something that we don't know actually is. Perhaps it wasn't signed by him. So just writing something like that underneath the paper doesn't sound particularly secure to me in 2017. We have much better ways of actually making sure that he was the one who actually made this paper and who actually signed that. So this is what the Estonian um, ID card looks like. No rocket science, most countries in the world, or not perhaps most, but many countries in the world, most countries in the European Union have something similar. And it has a chip on it, so I'm glad to borrow one from our ambassador. It has a chip on it. Again, no rocket science. Keep in mind that the Estonians started using it in 2002. By the way, again, one honest thing to think, say, we didn't invent it as a national ID. We were not the first. The first ones were the Finns. They introduced that six months ago. We started using that six months after. Finns still don't use it uh, as much as, as we do, nowhere near as much. In Estonia, um, we have logged in and done sign digital signatures more than any, uh, all the rest of the world combined. So uh, either we sign a lot of things, which I'm not sure is the case, or others don't do almost anything uh, with digital signature. And, and my dream is, and I will tell more about this in the future, that all of us will use only digital signatures and identifications in the future. And you just keep the handwritten signature for guest books and autographs and diplomas. <laughs> you mentioned that I, I used to work as a prime minister of uh, Estonia for three years. And uh, it's honest to say that around 90% of all the signatures I gave 
were using uh, my digital identity. Not, not the handwritten ones. Not, only handwritten ones are the ceremonials and, and uh, kind of, yeah, diplomas and, and, and things like that. So basically the point of digital identity, you need one part of uh, the ID on any format of physical chip. It can be ID. It is also something that we call mobile ID, which means that the telcos in Estonia uh, hand out SIM cards. Again, they do the same here. But our SIM cards have one additional bit of information on it, and this is the one part of the key on, on the physical card. The other part of the key is inside my head, and it's a pin code. So together, if you have a pin code plus a physical key, it creates a 2048-bit long encrypted uh, password. None of us can probably keep in mind, even the smartest minds cannot keep in mind the uh, 2048 uh, uh, bit encrypted uh, key, which is not only numbers and, and, or not even, even uh, only letters, it's very, very complicated. So in a way you can think of it as the safest password you can imagine. And of course, when technology develops, when there will be quantum computers, things like that, we need to make it even longer, even more complicated. The algorithms have to develop all the time so that even with uh, one year of time, nobody could uh, hack it or, or uh, break it. Uh, so in essence, digital ID, which gives you the same things as pass showing a passport gives you uh, in the physical world. Again, in the beginning of this century, we built uh, something that we call x -road, which is basically an exchange layer. So we don't have in Estonia a super information system. We have separate information systems for tax authority, for population register, for health board, for banks, everything. Schools, universities, every, everybody has their own information systems. We made this layer, this is the cloud in the middle, that uh, connects them all. So basically, uh, you don't need to build. If you, if you for example, uh, build a new solution, like a new social security electronic uh, portal, you don't need to connect this portal to each and every other uh, information system. You only connect it to the middle, middle layer. And, and through that middle layer, we have the linkages. So it's like a huge crossroad uh, in the middle. Not very difficult to uh, build, not very difficult to understand, but extremely helpful in things like uh, connecting the information systems. And I will, I will show you why this is um, so very important. Here you can see that uh, there is like 900 uh, different information systems uh, um, connected, and, and we have uh, 500 million plus transactions each and every year. So let's keep in mind that uh, we have 1.3 million people, so the amount of transaction is uh, like, every person has, has at least one transaction every year, every day, sorry. And, and the, the similar solution is now built in Finland, uh, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Namibia, Far Faroe Islands, and, and the number of those areas continues to grow. And the point being, why we built the same thing, or actually the Finns built the same thing in Finland, is that uh, if you can connect the two countries' information systems, you can enable services to travel cross-border as well. We have calculated that we save every year an Eiffel Tower height of paper in Estonia. That's a lot. That's, Eiffel Tower is more than 300 meters. You know, that's, that's a lot. But that's not the biggest saving. The biggest saving is the amount of money that we save without uh, necessarily uh, showing up to uh, state or, or municipal offices uh, to do something without uh, signing things uh, on spot and, and kind of sending the papers uh, by mail. But also uh, we are skipping the unnecessary bureaucracy. How many of you have uh, been uh, annoyed by the fact that you need to fill in some information that the government already knows about you? What is your name? Where do you live? Uh, do you have children? Hello, you should know that already. I have like, <laughs> I, have, I was told that to the government that I have two children, so why, why are you asking me that? This is a rather common problem, right? When you, uh, some of you who are not um, uh, uh, Singaporean nationals, if you come to Singapore, you will be asked uh, at the border every time uh, where you come from, what is your name, all those same questions. Some of those questions still need to be asked. Whether, for example, have you been to, I think it was South America during the last uh, six days. But others, what's your name, where you live, this is something that uh, actually can be skipped. In Estonia, we have decided to introduce, and this is a less technological and more political thing, we have introduced the principle once only. This means that whenever a, c a citizen has told some information to a government agency, you shouldn't be asked this information again. Let me give you an example. The official place to keep uh, the addresses of all people is the population register. 
if you have tilled the population register where you live, you register it like your official address. Of course, you do that not by showing up and showing your passport, but you logging in with your electronic ID. Once you have tilled them, the other information systems that have the right to know your address should ask the population register, not you. So basically, if you log into tax authority system to declare your taxes, they should ping for your information uh, from population register to get your uh, address. If they need to know whether you have children, for example, in some cases, uh, some countries have tax subsidies for those who have more children, they can ping also uh, whether you have children. So this is, can be all automated. They don't actually need to ask you that. And, and in many cases, they only can, uh, need to ask for your consent or, or your agreement on something. They don't actually need to ask you any information. Also, the tax authority should not ask me how much money I made. First of all, because I got uh, my money from the government anyways, or, or the parliament, which is a public, public entity. But even with working for private uh, companies, all companies uh, every month declare how many payments they made to which citizens. So that information is immediately linked to me and tax authority immediately knows how much money I made. So only if I made some money abroad, uh, then I might be asked. But uh, in the future, I believe that these systems can be interlinked as well, and, and they just need to ask my consent. And if I say, let's say to the Finnish or Singapore uh, tax authorities that yes, it's okay to uh, send my information to Estonia as well, that will happen automatically. So I think in, in the future, we shouldn't even ask for that uh, uh, information. The other very important principle is that every service is digital by default. For example, uh, let's take any register. If I have a paper saying that I live on this street and the official population register says elsewise, the information that is on the register is the one who is considered to be default uh, uh, or, or original in a way. Uh, the same thing applies to any ownership. If I have a paper saying that uh, I owe this car or this property and the register says elsewhere, the register is, is still considered to be the default, which also means that we have to make sure that none of this information ever disappears. So that's why we have uh, invested a lot to backups, which is you know, the obvious thing anyone should do. Uh, but then we also have uh, invested to a thing we call a data embassy, which means that uh, those servers are not only in Estonia. The first ones abroad we uh, built in Luxembourg, but we will have in different geographic locations. So basically, if something happens and no server in Estonia can work, we can run our information systems from Luxembourg or Australia in the future or US or wherever, we, or Singapore for that matter. So you just need a very good internet connection and we can build our data embassy there, which of course is a bit complicated from legal uh, aspects. We, you need to have control, legal control over that data as well. Even if it is on the territory of Luxembourg, we have a agreement, uh, just like uh, we have the agreement on, over a territory of our embassy, this data also is operating under the Estonian legislation. That's why we call it the data embassy. When you build a uh, country that is increasingly digital, it is extremely important that you focus on security aspect of, of that as well. Estonia was the first country in the world to experience a full-scale cyber attack in 2007. And um, that was uh, full-scale because Government was uh, attacked because uh, banks were attacked, media, so that was like a wider part of society. In essence, it was a DDoS attack. Many of you know what a DDoS attack uh, means. And we were able to successfully defend ourselves. We learned a lot. Mainly, we were successful to defend because the system is very decentralized. And you cannot attack like one place uh, at, uh, at the point. And now, of course, when we have data embassies, you need to attack different countries, different type pieces. It's, it's, it's becoming so much more complicated for any hacker to attempt that. And of course, in order to become smarter and smarter, we decided to establish, together with our um, friends and colleagues from NATO and other countries, uh, we established the NATO Center of Excellence in Tallinn, Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. We have most of the NATO countries uh, participating and some countries that are not NATO members. So I have invited Singapore to join in as well, and, and that has actually raised some interest here. Every time where we have military exercises, um, we also have part of this exercise in the cyber domain. Cyber, by the way, is now an official domain of NATO. We have land, we have uh, air, we have sea. US has even space as a war domain. That is not uh, everywhere in NATO because not all of us have the space, spaceships. And, and you know, the fourth one officially in NATO is cyber, cyber domain. So NATO is thinking very, very seriously about that. But whenever we have um, 
a military exercise, we also exercise defending the country uh, by uh, cyberspace. And by, for that, we don't have a million hack hackers working for the uh, defense because we don't have as many people. We, don't ha we cannot afford that. So we have a thing called uh, Cyber Defense League, which means that the best ICT guys working for different uh, companies, banks, software engineers, they, for their free time, they come and exercise together with us. So trusting on uh, private sector is, is a big thing. Three principles uh, that have to be in practice and have to be also made very public and every people has to trust that this is really the case. So the confidentiality of the system, no information can be made available for those who, who cannot, uh, who doesn't uh, need to see that. Availability, which is the enabler in the format of XROAD and integrity. Data integrity is the third important thing I don't have much time touching on, but uh, just have to keep in mind that if any part of this register is changed, as I said, digital is the default. If any part of that uh, register is changed, you might be in trouble. If somebody changes uh, the ownership of some house, you are in trouble. That's why we uh, have used also in many of our information systems the blockchain technology, which is uh, something I probably doesn't need to explain to you. This is uh, something that uh, helps us to um, a great deal. Now let's come back to the um, benefits uh, that this gives to me as a citizen. I already explained that it's uh, less bureaucracy, but it's also uh, very, very practical to get services uh, digitally. We, as private citizens, we have changed from using uh, travel agents and meeting the travel agents physically. We use Booking.com, we use uh, Airbnb, many of those kind of apps. Uh, we as private citizens usually don't visit bank offices, do we? We use some sort of internet banking uh, for doing that, and so forth and, and so forth. But still most people in the world, in order to get a public service, they need to show up in some municipal office, in some uh, government office, and this doesn't need to be the case. So in Estonia, most of the services are electronic. To establish a company, it takes you usually a few hours, and of course, you do it only by logging into the um, respective portal. If you declare your taxes, it takes you usually two to three minutes uh, you, because you only have to go through the information that government has about you. You just have to confirm, yes, I didn't make any money in Singapore. I only have the Estonian income. So yes, that's it. We're especially interesting for politicians. We uh, even have the uh, kind of slot there where you can enter whether you were bribed. So if you had some bribe, you can declare that. I don't know if anyone has ever done that because it's just like in Singapore, it's highly illegal to get bribed, but there is a place to declare that <laughs> should you, should you um, want the police knocking on your door. So it's possible to be honest even if you're corrupt, which is a bit, a bit uh, strange concept, of course. We believe that actually the best services that the government can provide to a citizen are the ones that you don't need to worry about at all. So in principle, you, uh, it's possible to uh, declare the taxes in a way that you don't actually declare anything. Everything is automized. And that will happen uh, by 2020. And also we will offer this system for small companies uh, um, also very soon. In principle, if you're like hairstylist, if you have a beauty salon with just you know, a couple of people working, or if you are like self-employed person, uh, you sell flowers, for example, you, you don't want to hassle with the bureaucracy. You don't usually want to deal with the accounting. So this is one of the highest barriers there is for you to doing business. So we basically link the, uh, your account, uh, if you agree to do so, to the tax authority, and, and this is automized, everything. So you just get the tax, uh, like not fee, but the check for the taxes, and you just pay the taxes, and you don't worry about it anymore. The same thing, actually, we did with Uber drivers. Uh, Uber is uh, highly, or the Singapore company or the Estonian company, we have also similar, similar companies established by Estonians and, and the Singaporeans. Uh, it's hugely controversial in many societies because people think that those guys don't pay the taxes. Well, what we did in Estonia, we invited them to the tax authority and agreed with them that uh, at the end of every month, the driver's information will directly be sent to the tax authority from the information system. Because to, to, every, probably all of you have used Uber, you know that uh, every information about every ride is anyways in the, in the information system. So there is no cash, there is no thing that you have to register manually. We, just, we don't need to know uh, which driver took whom from where to where. This is the information the government doesn't need to know and shouldn't know. But what the government needs to know is how much money you made in this month. And if it was 2,000 Estonian uh, 
uh, euros or <laughs> European euros, 2,000 euros, then the uh, tax authority will automatically tell you that, okay, we take 20%. That's it. So in every, every aspect, uh, if a platform is digitized, the same could happen to Airbnb. It could happen to many other companies that are fully, fully digital. And now I come to the good news. This is called the e-residency. What is e-residency? E-residency is handing out those digital identities to anyone in the world. I was asked several times by the Singaporean ICT minister, uh, uh, why do we do that? How do we monetize on that? And the honest answer is we actually don't monetize on that, but we do uh, think that this might act as a teaser uh, for, and that this might speed up things a bit. Until the ultimate dream is that all governments in the world uh, introduce the similar digital IDs. I know that Singapore government has a plan. They will most probably do that. But until then, if a Singapore citizen or, or citizen of any other country for that matter wants to have digital identity, you can get the Estonian one. So welcome to become uh, an uh, e-Estonian. It's a bit difficult to get it here uh, because it doesn't happen every day. We, we don't have our embassy here. But uh, you just apply for it digitally once, and then uh, every three or months or so, the consul uh, comes here, takes our fingerprints, looks at your face, says, okay, I believe this is you, identifies you, and then you get it. So that's, that's basically how it works. So it takes a bit more time uh, here than it takes uh, when you come to Estonia or when you go to our embassy, but you can get it as well. The last time I checked, we had 93 Singaporeans already uh, who have EU residency, but globally, we only started with that 2014, and globally we have 25,000, and the number is growing every day, uh, who have become e-Estonians. And you can access similar services like an Estonian. Most of those people have actually applied for that out of curiosity in the beginning, but uh, more than 10% of them have already established company in Estonia after they have found out that uh, the ease of doing business is at the level that it makes sense. If you want to have an EU company, you should do it in Estonia. This is the concept that we were the first in the world to introduce, uh, and uh, we have now e-residents from 138 countries. So as we have uh, around 60 to go, a bit more. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, it's also uh, working the other way around. Estonians living in other countries can use the digital services as well. So, the, for example, the most extreme thing that we have ever done with our digital identity is voting. If an Estonian goes to vote, two-thirds of us go to the polling booth, they wear ties, they invite their family, they put the paper just like, you know, you see from the CNN, Angela Merkel was voting on paper, everything is very ceremonial, very nice. One-third of Estonians doesn't go anywhere. They log into the system, cast their vote online. They either use computer, tablet, mobile, some type of computing device. And in order to use that, you only need this electronic ID and internet connection. You're good to go. Which also means that Estonians living in Singapore, and there are a growing number of, of those, can vote without even going to the embassy. The closest embassy is in New Delhi, by the way, so it's not a nice, like, short trip to go, like a walk, it's not a walking distance in principle. And it makes the life of Estonians uh, much easier abroad. So uh, the last time we had elections, or the previous time we had elections, 2015, uh, we had votes coming from 116 countries. So most of the globe was covered. Nobody present in, in some of the countries, no Estonian present in, in some of the countries, even though if you have read Hemingway, you have probably, uh, Notice that Hemingway wrote, uh, wh wherever you go, in, in every port of the world, you could always meet an Estonian. Today, it's even more. It's like tens of Estonians at every port. So we are like a small popularity, but we are well diversified in terms of uh, geographic location. Any uh, health record in Estonia that is produced by any doctor goes to a central system and is, uh, of course, it's electronic, not a kind of cellar with huge piles of paper. It's electronic. So what's the benefit? There are around six hospitals in Singapore. Right, that? So basically, point being that if you are treated in one of those hospitals and then all of a sudden you need to go to another one, then they can kind of get this information how you have been treated, what are your allergies, what's the blood type. This is crucial information in many cases. In Estonia, we have all centralized that, every information is there. Now, of course, you have to take care that nobody misuses that data. So basically, in order for a doctor to access that, they have to log in electronically as well using the same identity. And once they do that, uh, there is a mark left behind. So basically, if a doctor looks at your data without having the reason to do that, you can press charges. And you yourself can log in any time, and you can see who has looked at your data.
So this is how we have just one example how we give citizens control over the over the information and how we make sure that citizens start trusting. How many of you watched the Formula One race around a week ago, a bit more than a week ago? Oh, some of you did. Well, um, all of you probably noticed that it was there. All of you probably know a person called, uh, whose name is Michael Schumacher. And then this very unfortunate um, uh, accident that happened to him, the medical data was stolen. And it was stolen on paper. Uh, some nurse or janitor, we don't know exactly who that was, I think, went to the seller of this clinic, looked at this data and made it public. Now, in Estonian system, you could, as a citizen, either block this uh, if it's a sensitive case and if you are a celebrity, so nobody can actually see your health data. Or if somebody looks at it and publishes it, you can immediately go to the log and you have like 100% uh, certainty of getting caught. So no, nobody is so stupid to commit a crime where you will certainly be uh, caught. You don't need to use your computer at all in order to benefit from digital services. For example, digital prescription. This has been the default prescription, uh, which means 99% uh, from 2008. And it means if I am at my summer house and I need a prescription drug for myself or my wife or my children, I call the doctor, she prescribes the medicine, I go to the nearest pharmacy and the pharmacy looks at my ID that makes sure that I have the right to uh, get this uh, information and then gives me the prescription drug. And that works very, very well and this gives me, I don't need to use a computer myself. I can show my passport or manual ID, like old school ID uh, to the pharmacist. And, and now why, one of the reasons why we build this X road to Finland as well is that there are so many Finnish people living in Estonia and Estonian people living in Finland. So if they go to pharmacy, they will get the prescription drug as well. So that again makes a lot of sense uh, for those people who don't live in the same country where their doctor lives. And there are many other cases like e-ambulance, you, you can benefit so much more things. We basically have a thing like, a bit like Uber for ambulances where uh, if you are uh, calling this uh, 112, which is the emergency number in Estonia, then uh, there is this person who sees instantly where is the closest ambulance, which one can, can contact you. So it's, it's not like old school anymore, but that's of course in many countries already rather developed. Education. Again, uh, digital. Usually whenever something uh, political is said, it is, uh, at least in Europe it works this way. Perhaps here you have uh, made it different, if I don't know, but uh, you, you probably can tell me. But whenever something uh, is said by a politician, it's usually uh, Churchill. So uh, basically all the quotes are, are told to be Churchill's quotes. Probably there are many others who have said the same thing um, on that, but uh, also supposedly Churchill has said that education is the uh, strongest equalizer in the world. I could say that uh, digital is you know, very, very close to that as well. So if you have digital access or access to digital services, that could be a huge equalizer in the society. We have built uh, a lot on that to, to make uh, sure that the children at the early age start using computers, that they get the digital uh, skills, and that actually they can use all the services. And it's also, again, secure and, and safe also for the parents. Because I don't know how many of you, when you were at um, like elementary years at school, how many of you uh, hid a um, diary from your parents because a teacher had written something you wouldn't want uh, the parents to see? Anyone? I did that, certainly. So some of the kids still do, but not possibly in Estonia, because the diary is made electronic. So whenever any th information there is, I get um, information directly from this uh, uh, electronic diary. And also my daughter, who's uh, eight years old, cannot uh, hide from me whether she has anything to study or not, because it's everything is in the electronic diary, and I, as a parent, have access. So it's safe for the parents as well. I not, don't know how happy the children are about it, but you know, hopefully they behave a bit better at school because of that. Also, a big plan to digitize uh, lots of the um, uh, materials that we use for studying. That is, again, something that is done in many nations. Uh, uh, but you know, using uh, computing device can be very, very annoying at school. And uh, phones, for example, are even prohibited uh, at my ch daughter's class because it's only second year and then you know, they would be using a lot of entertainment, not, not the, for the, the exact purpose. But we have special iPads for them so that they can uh, use the educational tools uh, at school. And of course, I don't need to tell you how much we can build on that uh, uh, if you have electronic tools. This was something that wasn't around when, when I went to high school, certainly. Lee Kuan Yew was uh, a true political uh, leader in, in many senses, and this needed a huge amount of visionary and, and, and power. And, and also taking things digital in a society, 
needs a lot of leadership, not only the technology. The technology I have been talking about is there everywhere in the world. It's not that only Estonians uh, you know, can use ID cards. Well, as I said, Finns started using that for, uh, before. But there is a lot of persistence and, and uh, communicating and the vision that is needed to push forward the digital agenda. Because people at some times are uh, afraid to change their behavior concept. Sometimes they are, because they don't understand digital world well enough, they are like, afraid because they might be something that they don't kind of know how, how it will be treated. So in principle, leadership is, is key to the digital uh, development, uh, not, not uh, technology and certainly not only money. Money is um, secondary in this because most of the digital services that we have are actually very, very cheap. And I, probably most of the services are saving you know, much, much more than they have ever cost us. Another thing that uh, I think politicians uh, should be thinking about is um, enabling new technology, staying out of the way and regulating in a way that is necessary. This cute robot, uh, this is, uh, that's not the moon, uh, that's, that's on, on ground in Estonia. Uh, we have hundreds of them uh, driving around, uh, not only in Estonia, but uh, in some, some other countries. And it's a delivery robot. So this is the device to end, uh, uh, be used for the last mile delivery. It's uh, very convenient, very simple to use, but in order for it uh, to drive, it would be extremely inefficient if somebody had to run after it with a remote control or, or you know, trying to guide it somehow. The point of this is being autonomous. So it's a self-driving vehicle and it is on Estonian road and it's perfectly legal. So we decided to legalize that because we think that this is an enabler. Even if, if you know, we don't all buy our food and stuff with using those uh, robots, we will get a lot of information uh, uh, how this technology can help us and what else can be there. So I don't think that it's a question of if, it's a question of when we will have self-driving cars in all the streets of, of Singapore, Tallinn, and, and so, so forth. And some of the countries will be hugely resistant to that, and they simply will be ones who will benefit later. In my opinion, having uh, self-driving cars, uh, this gives me as a citizen uh, the luxury of having a driver in a way. Not all of us can afford that. So it, it gives me the luxury if I take a self-driving car from here to KL to sit on the so to say back seat, or I can do that on the front seat now as well, be entertained or, or do my work or whatever. So I don't need to you know, drive the car. I do hope that we still will have cars with wheels uh, for purely fun purposes, because driving a car is actually amusing if you do it uh, for fun. But that's you know, another story. Um, this. Um, a thing was made legal um, earlier this summer, and, uh, and, and this um, was agreed by Estonian Parliament. I will let you guess. There is 101 members in Estonian Parliament. 40, uh, 84 were present when this vote was taken. 84. What would you think? How many of those 84 actually voted for this uh, amendment to make those robots legal? Eighty-four. Eighty-four. Yeah, all of them. Probably it will be more difficult with self-driving cars, a bit because it's more controversy. These things are rather harmless, so if you know, it hits you, you won't be hurt. But we already have the first accident with that. And let me tell you, the car that was involved in the accident, not the self-driving robot, the car was the one to blame, or actually the driver of the car. We learned a lot. This uh, robot was uh, kind of uh, on its side, but uh, that didn't, you know, deter us from using those things in the future. Uh, so I think we should be enablers, and as, as policymakers, we should keep in mind that it's not only like uh, uh, not criminalizing or not prohibiting them, but it's also regulating. It's giving them permission to drive where. We have to decide that, uh, like in our case, it's only on the pavements, on, on the pedestrian roads. Uh, and also, it's, it's, uh, you have to decide you know, how they might uh, react in certain cases. So this has to be agreed. Just like, you know, we have to agree at some point in every, every city, in every country, on which side of road every car is driving. So we haven't agreed between each other, of course, obviously. In Estonia, we drive on the other side, and you here on the other side. But that's fine. As long as we have agreed inside one territory where to drive, that's, um, that's uh, OK already. So this is, if you want to know more about those robots and uh, whether they will come to drive around uh, this campus anytime soon, Google Starship, that's the name of this company, Starship Technology. Now, I told you that uh, there are two services only, and this is 
buying or selling a property or getting married. So you still have to show up for that. I, I believe that uh, buying a property can be digitized fairly easily. Getting married is somewhat more difficult uh, to organize digitally and, and probably there is an element of pleasure in this ceremony as well. So yeah, I know from first hand experience I got married this August. So. Uh, I like the procedure, I like the uh, big uh, showing up there, so basically I think it's good to keep uh, this um, undigitized. Everything else can uh, and is digital. So with that, thank you for your attention. You can have, uh, those, are, those are the hashtags to follow if you want to know more about digital developments. The first one, obviously I put my mind, I wouldn't be a politician if I wouldn't be a bit, uh, uh, like having guess some, some vanity that has to be there always. Uh, and then we have the e-residence, Estonia Invest is the commercial uh, representation of Estonia. In, it's also present here in Singapore. There are 15 places globally where we are present and Singapore is one of them. So that you know, shows how much we uh, value uh, Singapore, uh, not only locally, but, but we see Singapore as a huge Im important center for, uh, for the whole region. And Startup Estonia is, uh, is the account of kind of hub of, uh, of many of our uh, startups. We, Estonia has the highest number in Europe, as was mentioned already, of startups per capita. And um, probably there's a good reason for that. And uh, many of those startups are actually in some how uh, linked to Singapore as well. So that's, but that's another story. Now I hope we have some time for Q&A. Thank you very much. Let, let me take the privilege of asking the first question. Uh, Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. He said he's worried about uh, robots and uh, artificial intelligence. So I would like to get your views. How would you regulate uh, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and robots uh, under your new legislation? Do they have legal standing, ethical, moral issues? Uh, what about uh, weaponized drones, weaponized cars, and uh, all, all these things? Mm -hmm. uh, who is liable for uh, what, what happens when drones do these nasty things? Well, thank you for this very um, interesting and very difficult question. I think uh, automating things is something that will happen with or without our uh, uh, kind of agreement. Uh, digitalization will happen with or without uh, our agreement. Uh, the technology will kind of do it for, self, uh, for itself. Let's just take back a century or two and, and think about uh, di uh, this uh, technological revolution. Many people were against technological revolution, industrial revolution uh, back then. But uh, it was about to happen. So you can somehow postpone it, but you cannot uh, make it from happening. The, the tools to dig uh, holes in the ground were meant to be in invented. So, so you have to just keep in mind that the men with shovel will have different kinds of jobs in the future. And the same will happen with uh, digitalization or, or self-driving cars or, or buses or lorries. I'm certain that uh, it, it's a matter of decades. I don't know how many decades, but I'm certain that uh, a driver of any sort of vehicle, be it bus, be it, uh, be it car, is much less common job in the future. Perhaps there will be some sort of drivers for some sort of vehicles, we don't know that. But certainly not bus drivers, certainly not yeah. uh, cab drivers. Right. Let, let me follow up on that, then I'll open the mm -hmm. door for questions. So who is liable if, say, a driverless car gets into an accident? Mm -hmm. Is it the software developer, the hardware developer, the Toyota, or the police who's negligent in this? or? Uh, well, this is the question that uh, hasn't been agreed on, obviously, uh, at least uh, on, on European level uh, yet. And it should be, of course, the most, uh, uh, most uh, critical uh, question in a way. So far, we have, um, we have uh, I, I would sort of say we haven't uh, been able to decide that. But I think um, this is something that has to be just a political decision at, at one point. And then just like, you know, it's not right or wrong whether you drive on the right side of the road or left side. We just have to make an agreement and, and, and live with that. I'm, I'm quite sure that it's highly less uh, likely for self-driving cars to get to an accident between each other than it is uh, with human action where, where the error might be much more likely. The cars cannot get drunk, at least yet. The cars uh, probably will have sensors to um, um, kind of cancel the, the probability of, of, uh, of collision. By the way, I was not allowed to drive a car for three years for the obvious reasons we, we were uh, speaking about before. I only had to sit in the back seat. When I realized uh, after that, uh, uh, becoming a parliamentarian and a normal person again, uh, being able to drive a car, I drove my wife's car and I realized how much technology had developed during those years. Uh, the car 
actually kept the speed. The car uh, was braking by itself. It was telling me when I was like uh, trying to cut corners, like in the Formula drivers, uh, it like, stick to the lane. So this kind of technology is in a very common consumer car already. Um, and and it, it's hugely, hugely helpful. It probably has already uh, uh, kind of made less accidents or, or made sure that there is less accidents. So, so in my opinion, uh, probably it will actually be uh, safer with, uh, with self-driving cars around. Uh, and the responsibility question has to be solved, but, but I, think, uh, I think this is not the one that should kind of deter us from, uh, from uh, having those cars around. So, so how do you put the, the people, the people? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the technology enhances the role of government. But what about those who want less government involvement in their lives? Actually, I'm not sure with the with the last question. I, I have never thought about it. I'm quite sure that it's uh, it's uh, it is not given to the family certainly, and then it shouldn't be accessible by anyone uh, anymore after that. But I actually should look up the, the answer. I, it might be different with different uh, information systems. It's a very very good question. Uh, probably something similar to what banks do with all the information. But I have to have to check it out. So honest answer is I don't know. In, in terms of PISA. Uh, we have been um, uh, historically very strong in math, physics, uh, uh, many subjects. So the education level has been very good in Estonia uh, for more than the time we have been independent. So that's a historic thing that's uh, not only linked to technology. Now, of course, we use much more technology to teach our kids, but that's probably not the main uh, factor. I think it's like the very, very good educational system that we have had uh, historically. Uh, big or small, I will. I would uh, say that uh, actually with electronic uh, resources, with digital world, you have less government officials, definitely. That's quite obvious because you don't need people putting some information to the computer and then printing it out. And every, if everything is kind of, you know, information systems communicate with each other. You, you need tens and tens uh, of, of people less in some particular office. We have made those reforms like one by one and we have witnessed tens of people being directed to some other jobs. Now, if you question more generally whether the government will have too much information about you, I doubt that. I think you actually know more that they, uh, what they have as a citizen. The information has always been there. It's simply the question uh, of how it's uh, linked and how actually it's made safer that those people who don't need to know your information don't see that. Uh, let me give you an example. The policeman who stops you uh, speeding can check for your address. This is okay. It can check uh, whether you have been speeding before, if you have been drunk driving, whatever. But he, it cannot, he cannot see anything about your health, cannot uh, ask, see anything about your income. Um, so they only see the information that they are supposed to see. And this is, again, a question of design, how to build the information system so that there is no super person, not even the prime minister. Actually, the prime minister doesn't see anything about you. Even if he can tell us the CIO of the state that I need to know his tax record, no possibility because the system is designed this way that you're not authorized. Uh, the last, uh, or the, actually the first question about digital divide uh, is not only age related, but it's also related to geography, of course. And we have made sure that first, internet is everywhere. Even at the most uh, remote areas, you can find 4G uh, coverage in Estonia easily. Of course, that's the same case in, in Singapore, but it's a huge issue in many countries. Uh, where in, in some areas you, you lack internet. Uh, so that's one part of the digital divide. That the, the infrastructure has to be decent. And with older people, uh, we used to have in the 90s, when this was the kind of starting uh, thing, we used to have um, huge uh, projects to educate them. We had at one point a project called Tiger Leap that educated 100,000 people. Like, clearly like taking 25 people, putting them to a classroom, telling them how computers work. That was a very, very kind of big project uh, nationwide. Today, there is less need for that. Uh, there are uh, many more people who actually can use those things. Um, there are people who still go to uh, state offices. So it's not 100% yet, but uh, it's, it's going to this direction. And one more thing that is helping us to get uh, older people abro uh, aboard is um, smartphones. Using a smartphone is so much more intuitive and easy than using a computer with, let's say, MS-DOS or MS Windows even uh, from 
from the 90s. So um, using a uh, mobile device is uh, yeah, bringing technology closer to us. First and foremost, with regard to your Latitude 59, mm -hmm. uh, in the conference, as you one of the picture uh, with Visibus, Prince Andrew, and uh, Tim's uh, Draker, what is the outcome? of their pitching and your pitching, number one. Number two, in regards, <clears throat> in regards to the reg uh, techs innovation, which is very much government innovation vis-a-vis -vis your e-government initiative. Now, you notice that the government innovation is not first coming. Regulatory innovation is very slow moving. How is Estonia contribution towards the initiative? Secondly, uh, with regard to your open internet, you say, you say that Singapore could be a potential, <coughs> potential partner, but then you see Singapore is internet control. How do you, you know, interplay with such limitation that you think that we can be a partner mm -hmm. in your proposition? Lastly, your technology uh, TCO and chief scientist was in this school last year, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with his proposition to, uh, on the e-residency, yet surprisingly, there's only 99 Singaporeans coming on board. Why? <laughs> but it looks to me that Estonia is an ideal place to have your own cryptocurrency, especially for internal transactions. What do you think about Estonia and also in general terms about cryptocurrencies? Uh, but, uh, one of the next things that you've talked about the incremental uh -huh. changes that you expect in health, for example, uh, transport, obviously, but, but what are the really next big um, ev evolutions that you expect Estonia will hope to lead? Well, that's actually the very, very important question. Uh, I am just now writing an article where I put down some things that, in my opinion, should be done to keep pedaling. I think uh, we can ride on the success of the past uh, only to a certain time, and, and we, I'm certain that Singapore, Dubai, many other countries will uh, move like that at a certain point. And, and then everybody will look at Singapore and Dubai and th those countries and see what, what they have to, uh, to have to offer. So uh, uh, I think it's a very, very good point that we need to um, uh, have new uh, things. Uh, first of all, what we lack uh, in Estonia is having those uh, services as apps. We, we very often have it uh, in web page, uh, so it's still kind of... Uh, old architecture, so introducing apps is very, very convenient. Uh, we have already many good cases, for example, I, and if I monitor my electricity cons consumption in my house, this is in an app, it won the best app of the, any publicly owned company in the world uh, in Dubai, but anyways, I should have everything uh, w with this design. Now, uh, we have tried to do, or introduce a thing called, um, uh, called, uh, Digital, um, say, well, we put, uh, digital registration for, uh, for doctors and hospitals. It's, in essence, it, it, and we have failed to do that for 12 years because the doctors and hospitals don't agree with us. The point is, in my opinion, we should uh, uh, book a doctor's visit exactly the same way as we are booking hotel room in Singapore or Estonia using an app called Booking.com. We should, okay, we did, don't use, need to, we have a special app we can create for that, uh, you're booking a doctor. But the point is, when I, as an Estonian citizen, want to visit an eye doctor, I should have a choice uh, not to call in each one of them, or not to, we have actually, some of the hospitals have their electronic registration, but this is only this hospital, but we have 19 hospitals in Estonia. So if I want to make sure which eye doctor in Estonia, or at, let's say in 100 kilometer range, is willing to see me first, I need this app. And, and that would help a lot in, in terms of access to the healthcare. But why the doctors and uh, hospitals don't want to give us the uh, information is, of course, they think that th their time slots is their power. They can, you know, make sure that you get it, you get it. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a bit too critical on, on our doctors. They are doing tremendous jobs and we have very high quality healthcare, but the fact is that we haven't managed to do that and we should. And there are many examples. E-government will never be ready, never. If you think it's ready, then it's kind of the start of the failure already. Uh, there are some of us in, in Estonian politics who think that our government is fully prepared. That's, uh, we are, we're still scratching the top of the iceberg to learn from a friend who is in fintech. Now, um, uh, Estcoin. That's a cool idea that has a uh, lot of, uh, kind of uh, intellectual uh, interest uh, to many, and that it's glad to see that it has flown to Singapore, and it's even probably more well-known in Singapore than in Estonia. 
at least at this point. Uh, but the idea behind that, as far as I understand, to, is to, to create the utility uh, token instead of uh, having a kind of alternative currency, because having an alternative currency is uh, difficult. We don't have our own Estonian currency anymore. We entered the Eurozone in 2011. So we have to you know, see very clearly what we can do and, and we, what we can't. Uh, um, but using um, blockchain as a technology, for example, is something that the Estonians are eager to do and that we have done. Uh, blockchain is powering uh, many public and private services uh, in Estonia. And, uh, and I think this is kind of distributed leisure is, is something that in many cases is, is actually a very, very positive thing to have in the, in the neighbor. Uh, now, um, question about the open internet. It's not, not to, about to exchange all the information. The one information that we want governments to trust with each other is, for example, only the information that we need. I don't, the Estonian government doesn't need all the information about all the city, uh, Singapore uh, people that the Singapore government has. We don't need that and we shouldn't have that. That is too much. But we, if you come to live in Estonia and you say, please enter, you might give the consent, for example, please get my information about me from the Singapore government. Don't ask me the stupid things where I live or how much money I make or, or if I have children. You shouldn't be asking me those things uh, about my background. You can just ping the Singapore government and you have that. It, it might require your consent in the future. We haven't settled that out because most governments don't have this uh, data exchange uh, yet. Uh, today, if any one of you goes to London, you have to prove where you live by showing your utility bill. It's 2017. Utility bill, gas bill, come on. I, I, okay, let's, let's uh, talk about that later. Uh, now, um, thank you for ad, uh, advertising Latitude 59. It's the coolest tech conference, a startup conference in the region uh, every spring. Uh, you should look at that up, definitely. Uh, it's a bit like Slush. Slush is now in Singapore as well. Slush used to start or started in, in Helsinki, which is our neighbor. And then those people who visit Slush in Helsinki usually often come to Estonia as well, especially if they are from this distance. Uh, it's you know, two, two hours ferry, but, but Latitude 59 is our own tech conference uh, supported by Enterprise Estonia and, and the startup community. And it's very, very interesting. And the thing, yeah, I certainly was on stage together with Prince Andrew and, and Tim Draper. This is very, very interesting uh, event and very inspiring event. And what happened uh, as a consequence was that uh, Prince Andrew, who is a political, or yeah, if you can say political leader, but he's a world, like, leader who uh, has put an enormous amount of energy to introduce investors and, uh, and startups to, uh, to each other. And he held his pitch at Palace event in Estonia as well. So that was, that was huge, uh, to take talent to this map uh, of, of global uh, startup and, and investor meetings. And who wouldn't want to you know, be associated with a meeting with Prince? Investors certainly do and startups most certainly do. So this is something actually other politicians should uh, learn from uh, Prince Andrew. Uh, I don't know if I can call him politician, but yeah, he has, he has the role of politician uh, or similar to politician in, in many aspects. And the last uh, point um, was about drag tax. You, you are very good in asking questions. You're like fire, you're much like Estonian parliamentarians. We tend to ask, we have one minute time slot and then we ask like seven questions and then the, as, as a prime minister, you have to like uh, <laughs> so I'm rather used to that. Now, uh, Rectech, uh, yes, governments are slow usually, but <laughs> you know, in Estonia, I had uh, one um, team of people pushing me uh, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis uh, to regulate quicker. And that was the startup uh, roundtable uh, that met regularly um, uh, in my office. Uh, so people from startups uh, came there and, and told me that, you know, you're so slow and you should work on it. So basically what we did was we, we introduced new things according to their proposals that we were able to agree on politically. And they were angry if it took us four months from idea to law. <laughs> so you can imagine that uh, Estonians being dissatisfied because four months in startup uh, uh, life is a uh, huge time. But of course, uh, to get the law in four months, uh, that's you know the, like running a running a five kilometer race. It's like always you're in, in the red zone in, of the of the heart rate. So uh, I think uh, I think in many cases the f uh, speed or or uh, or slowness or the pace of the legislators will make the difference which countries will be at the forefront and which will not. As I said, digital development will happen has happened in many cases. Uh, countries like Dubai that are super fast in deciding because they have much more vertical decision-making. 
they will do things like that. I have seen it myself. I have um, many times met the Dubai leader. I have seen how he thinks. I know that he has uh, a vision and I'm, he certainly has the means to execute that. It will happen. I believe that it will happen quickly in Singapore as well because I, I have seen um, some very sort of interesting uh, people, inspiring people having the enlightened uh, visions on, on some particular things and I would bet on them uh, pushing it through. Uh, Dr. Jadil being uh, one of them, he, uh, his team, uh, there was um, Mrs. Poch, uh, many of th those names probably are familiar to you. Um, and we need to keep doing that in Estonia as well, otherwise we will be you know, behind you and looking your backlights uh, after five years or, or two years even. So yeah, it's, it's a lot to do with political leadership and, and how fast or slow you are. And of course, uh, it's fair to say that uh, at EU level where we decide things together, we could be much, much faster in potentially. We, getting driverless cars to drive all around Europe, that's much more difficult than getting them uh, driving just in Singapore, just in Estonia. I'm interested in knowing about the secrets of uh, Estonia's uh, digital transformation. Can you tell us more about the policy innovations that the government introduced in terms of education, regulation, mm -hmm. financing, in order to encourage startups? Uh, mm -hmm. Singapore government is trying to build a startup ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how far are we successful, but uh, we want to know uh, what innovations did you introduce? Well, uh, I think the only real uh, thing that we have differently in terms of e-government development uh, than any other country in the world is that we actually started using e-identity and e-signatures. And that made all the difference. Of course, the base layer may, uh, and the system architecture, it has to be thought through, it has to be done properly, designed properly. So, but, but the key enabler, without what you cannot do anything or most of the things, is the digital identity. You need to make sure who is on the other side. That was the e-government part. Now, startup part, um, uh, very often it's, uh, you know, government staying away uh, from kind of disturbing them, like uh, just give them the, the uh, playground or, or uh, society where they actually have this marketplace or, or can, can develop. Uh, but we have to keep in mind also that startups uh, don't usually think uh, as Estonia or Singapore as their only home market. So uh, the key to success uh, in startups is usually internationalizing. And, and uh, those companies who are established in Singapore most probably see their home market uh, first as uh, Southeast Asia and then at the second level immediately, you know, either global or, or much bigger region than, than only, only this, this one area. Um, I don't know, we have a couple of very successful startup uh, people around. They might be better to answer what is good and what is bad in, in, in Estonia in terms of establishing a, a startup. But I would think that uh, there are many uh, people with, with high, high skills uh, uh, in Estonia. Uh, when I had to pitch uh, with Prince Andrew and Tim Draper why Estonia is a better community for startups than London or San Francisco, which is a bit difficult uh, to pitch, then I told that in Estonia you actually can afford a decent uh, uh, house, which is not the case in London or, or, uh, or San Francisco. So this, or, yeah, this is the case how uh, we kind of can, this is one of the arguments how we can attract talent. We, we cannot compete with San Francisco and London by being like global metropoles. This is not, you know, it's, it would be unreal to think that we are like them in this respect. But, but to have the talented teams in Estonia, sometimes we have to play on the cards that we, are our strengths. Yeah. Also, they, I believe that the ease of doing business is a key. And in this respect, uh, Singapore, of course, is a role model. I think uh, you should keep that and perhaps uh, further develop that. And, and the signal why, whether Singapore is good or not, I think the point that there are uh, 34 Estonian uh, businessmen uh, with us uh, means that the interest is very high. And, and we have several uh, companies like TransferWise, Thunderbeam, uh, uh, who, uh, who have been uh, starting their offices here and, and uh, starting their businesses for Southeast Asia here. Smartly, yeah, exactly, uh, God time. Uh, I probably have forgot somebody uh, unjust. Uh, transfer friend is in, in uh, KL. So it's, it's we, we, we are trying to find a solution to our cashless, uh, you know, it's, it's chaotic here to pay. Uh, you have four, you know, very chaotic. Uh, so does Estonia, can, can Estonia offer Singapore a solution to just solve this cashless <laughs> problem? Uh, I'm afraid not, but uh, we still have cash in Estonia. 
for some reason. I, I don't actually, I, I'm the only one who probably doesn't operate at all with cash. I'm always in trouble when uh, uh, going to a restaurant because it's polite to leave uh, some tips uh, and, and I'm always very bad at that. Uh, so because I only carry my, my plastic card. But uh, I think uh, many businesses that today uh, are operating with cash will be cashless uh, again, whether or whether or not the government wants that. Businesses themselves see very well that it's so much easier to have transactions electronically. Like paying for an Uber, or I have been driving uh, one taxi, which was very difficult because I had to borrow uh, uh, money from my local uh, friend to pay for that taxi. Uh, I paid uh, in Singapore dollars, but I have, the rest of the time I have opted for an app to, to uh, use Uber whenever I need to catch a, catch a cab. Right. Uh, and uh, this goes so much more conveniently. And if, if this is a trip uh, wherever in the world that is uh, associated with my work, I can also send the check to my, uh, my team and it right. can be reimbursed or whatever. So it's, it's so much better than you know, handing out. The, so so, so this is a question for politicians. Do we really need governments to have a digital ID? All of my digital transactions are validated by Google or Facebook. No government involvement. So why do we need to go to government to have a digital ID when? Uh, well, as long as we need governments to issue documents that are legally documents, uh, th then we need governments to issue digital ID as well. First of all, Facebook password is nowhere near secure. Facebook is, uh, I, I hope I don't tell you this as a big news, but Facebook is not particularly kind of safe in terms of data privacy. So you might get some of the information <laughs> about you. Uh, also like uh, guys, guys in Facebook uh, analyzing that. This is something that we don't do in Estonia uh, in, in our government system. And so I think uh, the ID so that it can be legally used properly, it has to be uh, at least today government issued. We have agreed in the world that you need documents, right? You cannot travel with your uh, showing your uh, Facebook profile picture, can you? Uh, so, uh, and you cannot sign documents that are legally valid uh, in the eyes of, of the country or, or court in Facebook as well. Uh, so, first of all, Facebook ID or, or whatever password is, is not safe enough to be considered as a signature. And, and uh, as long as you need uh, official signature, it's, it's not only about technology, it's about legislation as well. And in order to make it legal as your signature or as your identity, at least in today's world, it needs to be government issued. Okay. Okay. But it can be Estonian government issued, so use the A residency, right? Okay. Okay. How do you think Estonia should start to set, look to set international standards? Because not all governments have the same standards and some might implement um, the technology that you're using. Um, and use it in different ways. So would international uh -huh. standards need to be looked at? Uh -huh. Your Excellency, I would like to ask uh, your opinion on uh, actually using the technology to make democracy more direct. Uh, since it enables us to have, for example, a referendum without people actually coming to the polls and without using uh, tons of money and uh -huh. tons of paper, uh -huh. which enables us to make a referendum much more often, much more efficiently, uh, do you think it is possible that in some near future, referendum will be much more often and it will actually become a part of political life of citizens? Is there any plan like this? So you're this? saying we do away with representatives and just direct voting? <laughs> well, it's a hard question for representative, but... <laughs> well, if I may answer that directly, I, if, if you actually come to think of that, uh, are we as citizens uh, informed enough on all issues to decide on them uh, on, on a referendum, main issues, of course, but on the technical issues like legislation usually is. Um, even in the parliament, you, you need to, it's, it's, first of all, parliament is usually a full-time job, and even in the parliament, you need guys who specialize on finances, who know everything, every detail about the budget. You need guys who specialize on, uh, on legislation that is related to agriculture and so forth. If you had potentially a referendum on each and every thing, I'm not sure that actually it would be, uh, it would be theoretically very open society, but I don't think that but it would actually can function. Can you not uh, do a program, artificial intelligence, <laughs> to optimize the budget yeah. depending on the preferences yeah. of the voting but population? But the point of being a human being is not uh, being only rational. You know, we have emotions. So <laughs> rationally, probably we wouldn't, uh, you know, probably, uh, let's say, um, uh, Elvis Presley was not the best singer in the world, rationally thinking, but somehow he was very popular. So. Uh, and that we like that, and then, I don't know if Elvis Presley is a good example. We are way too young, or most of it. <laughs> I don't know who's the who's the popular singer here. Well, 
yeah, well, let's give, let's give that aside. Probably it's not about uh, uh, all about rationality. I, it's, it's definitely, with those technologies, it's definitely easier to organize uh, participation in democracy. And that's certainly the good thing. Uh, we can use it also in local level, in, in communities where there are things that we need, where you actually need to discuss people, uh, consult people more. Uh, so, so yes, of course, we can use elections with the fraction of the cost as it, as it were otherwise. Um, and, uh, and actually it doesn't, at all cases, you don't need to have it uh, as secure as we have built the Estonian e-government elections. There are, there are companies that provide e-polling uh, in the communities as well. So basically sometimes polling is safe enough if you don't need to worry about the security and, and the privacy of the vote. But when it comes to democracy, you need to develop a proper uh, uh, internet voting because most of the things that people call e-voting in the world are nowhere near as close as they should be. So the e-voting needs identity, security, and in our case also privacy, because in, by, according to the Syrian constitution, nobody is entitled to know whom I voted for. If I want to tell you whom I voted for, I might, but uh, I, the government should not know. Yes, um, you mentioned about blockchain um, being used for um, applications, certain providing certain public and private services mm -hmm. in Estonia. Do you have any concerns or any risks that you have seen um, in, in those um, uh, services that are powered by blockchain. And my second question is, how is Estonia getting ready for uh, GDPR implementation? Well, um, Estonia, as, as the EU presidency now, is uh, working very hard to take the digital single market uh, forward. And, and uh, there are two positions uh, that Estonia has. One position is our own country position, and the other one is the official position as presidency, where we have to be very neutral and have to help everyone find a, uh, common grounds. Our own position is uh, much more uh, liberal and uh, much more towards, uh, towards uh, freer use in a way, but it's kind of more difficult topic than, than to cover it only with, with uh, two, two sentences. And the previous question was about um, about um, blockchain uses, which I see it uh, as a troublesome. We we use blockchain on government level. We use it for uh, mainly for making sure that uh, that nobody uh, kind of changes the data, and we, we keep it's mainly for data integrity in many cases. For example, I don't think that in Estonian elections we could use a blockchain. Uh, I, I spoke yesterday to a guy from New Zealand uh, who was in the Innovation Labs present, presenting his technology based on blockchain uh, uh, that was supposed to be used for voting. And he agreed with me that uh, it can only be used when the voting is not uh, only secretive. So you, you have to make sure uh, probably that, uh, that, uh, that only you yourself can see it. Perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps I don't know the, all the details of blockchain, but I believe that there might be some services where blockchain is, is not, uh, not the best used. Uh, we have private services. Actually, the lady behind you, uh, sitting behind you, is um, a founder of a company that uh, built uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, stock exchange for companies. It's called Thunderbeam, and it's now in, in Singapore market uh, as well, or entering the Singapore market. And the point is that uh, you need to make sure who owns what. And, and if you want to, uh, let's say a startup wants to sell only like 10%, and you want to change, uh, not to sell it like uh, as a one stock, but you need to have, uh, like, say, thousand people buying, uh, I don't know, 50 euros each or 200 euros each, then uh, you can provide this kind of uh, playing ground for them or, or system for them or stock exchange for them where they can do that. And using blockchain, as far as I understand, makes it happen. So it, make, it makes it kind of secure. And it's quite important to know who owns that. So I think it, in terms of registers uh, and places where it's necessary to know the history of the transaction and also the actual current owner of this particular thing, it seems to me that blockchain is a good tool for that. Uh, la last question, talking about cryptocurrency. Uh, so Bitcoin issued only 21,000 units, as I understand it. So eventually it will be unstable once you uh, reach that limit. Now, China is developing its own uh, Chinese currency backed by the central bank mm -hmm. and tied to the Alibaba payment and all that stuff. And I think it's technically viable. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what are your thoughts about this Chinese? Uh, and, and, you know, they can bypass all these American sanctions mm -hmm. if you just log into this uh, mm -hmm. uh, system. Well, I think that uh, essentially um, electronic payments that are uh, much faster and much more intuitive than the current internet banks uh, are about to happen anyways. Uh, I think Chinese have been very developed in terms of using uh, payments that are based on uh, social media, for example, like, like WeChat, 
and, and uh, I think that the current internet bank payments uh, are, are a bit too slow for many. The company I mentioned before, TransferWise, is also working on this sector where to make uh, payment from Singapore dollars to euro faster and, and uh, um, more, more cheap also. So uh, there is definitely room for fintech companies to, to build on that uh, because we as customers are not satisfied with the current pace and, and uh, price. Now, I'm not smart enough to say whether uh, what will happen to any particular uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, not all of them will make us billionaires, that's for sure, but, but some of them have a uh, very good uh, ground and a very uh, act logical point back, backing it up. But uh, how, what will be the price of one Bitcoin in one year is uh, something that you need a much smarter person than me to, <laughs> to ask. <laughs> okay, we've read out of Bitcoin time. Uh, so please join me in thanking the, the Prime Minister for his insights. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.